All right, well, we're ready to tackle the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. The first part we did was actually part two. Uh, that was all the area things and being able to calculate a definite integral, which means an area, by doing that whole subtraction. Find the antiderivative plug in B, find the antiderivative plug in A, and subtract the two. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. The part one basically says this. It says that derivatives and integrals are inverses. It says one undoes the other. That, that's basically the idea in the most common, like, small sense I can make it. So let's suppose we have this, this function, y equals f of x is some function, and it's continuous over a certain interval. It starts at a, a point, and ends wherever we want. It ends at some x down the way. You get me on that? Some, some x, even, even changeables, provides continuous up to that point. Then the area is a of x. We already know that. Area is going to be some area function such that when I take the first derivative of my area, what does it have to give me in this case? Say it again. Very good. So if f of x is continuous over this, then the area is a of x, some area function, and the derivative of the area function must give me back my <coughs> function, my original function. That was the antiderivative thing. Saying that this is the antiderivative, uh, this is the antiderivative of that, treating this like a derivative from going backwards. Well, I could write that a different way. I could write that also as the area then should be the integral of f of x. We also had that from from the, the from what we've been studying, right? It says that if I want to find the area, it should be the integral of f of x dx. from A to X. You okay with that as well? It says that the first derivative of the area is going to give me my function back. Therefore, the antiderivative of my function between my two bounds, whatever they happen to be, should give me my actual area. It should give me the area. Now, this is in terms of not a B, but an X, so as to give me the a of x, not the actual area. Does that make sense? It will be a function of the area. That's what it's saying there. How many will feel okay with that so far? Now I'm going to do one thing so that we don't get a little bit confused because it's kind of awkward to have a function in terms of x and then have a bound of x. What we use here is called a dummy variable. It really doesn't matter. It's just a variable that we're going to be integrating because you're going to be plugging in x later anyway. So the x's will appear. So typically what people do at this point is they go, you know what, let's not call it f of x. Let's call it f of t dt. They make it a dummy variable. Now, why the dummy variable doesn't matter is because when you think about it, when you take the integral of this, you're going to have a function in terms of t, correct? But look at your bounds of integration. You're going to go from a to x. You'll be plugging in the x's somewhere for your t's. You'll reinsert them into your equation. That would give you an area function <coughs> in terms of x like we're looking for. How many will feel OK with this so far? OK. Well, here's the basic idea. I'm going to try to try, tie all this together for you real nice and neat. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to try. I'll, I really will try here to make it neat. Would you agree that this equals this? Yes? Mm -hmm. For sure. You, you believe that? Yeah. Oh, then we're almost done. That's fantastic. Very good. Because this means a derivative, right? That means a derivative. So the first derivative equals f of x. The first derivative equals f of x. However, we also have this statement right here. What I'm going to do is make a little substitution right there. So what this says is the derivative of a of x Here's another interpretation of a of x. What's it have to equal? What did this equal? Are you seeing that this 
is the same thing as this. Yes or no? This is A of X, so is that from right here. I just went this way. I made A of X that way. That has to equal F of X as well. This right here is the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. Yeah, because we talked about this first. And, does it, and so, what, and so where you have the f of t, because of the way you do the integral, you're just swapping it out and inserting your x to make it come out with f of x, not f of t? Right. We use the, uh, we use the, the t here so you don't get confused in x with x, because it's hard to think about, oh, I'm going to plug an x in for an x? That's weird. Why do we do that? But, so what we do is we use a t and say I'm plugging in both x and a for my t. Or you could like use x subscript 1, x subscript 2 to keep them separated. Or does it doesn't matter what we use besides T? No, you could use uh, H there if you really want. T is a dummy variable, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you're going to be integrating some variables, right? For those variables, you'll be plugging in X's. That's the idea. Did you follow? A of X equals this. Derivative of A of X equals this. Therefore, derivative of this equals F of X. That's the thing about theorem of calculus part one. Here's what it says in plain English. It says, if you take a, what's this stand for? Of a, what's this stand for? It will give you back your function. That's it. If you take a derivative of an integral, basically it undoes everything. It, it essentially says there are inverses. It says a derivative undoes an integral. A, an integral of your function. It gives you something, right? An area function, as it, as it will. Then you take a derivative of that, ah, gives you it right back. Gives you your original function back. Now, why? Why? Why is this important? Because that seems pretty common sense, doesn't it? I mean, we've already kind of thought that, well, I mean, shoot, if an integral is undoing a derivative, it should be the inverse of a derivative. This, this proves it, that a derivative is the inverse of, of an integral. But how, why we do it is because sometimes it makes, um, makes certain integrals very easy to do. Uh, here's why. Maybe not certain integrals, but certain computations very easy to do. Without doing any work, any work, you can tell me what this is, actually. Say what? T to the fourth. Not T to the fourth, you're very fourth. close. X to the fourth. Without doing any work. Why? Well, because you have a derivative of an integral. The integral starts, I don't care, but it ends at X wherever it is. That means that this is going to be whatever our dummy variable is, but with an X instead. So this becomes X to the fourth. By this, by this theorem. By that theorem. If you want to see it proved out, which we can do that directly, I'll show it to you right now. Um, that would be a derivative of, if you did the integral, you're going to get t to the fifth over 5 from 1 to x. True? What that would give you is a derivative of x to the fifth over five minus one to the fifth over five. Do you see where the x is coming in? Do you see why we have a dummy variable? Doesn't really matter. You're plugging in x for it anyway. Okay. Do you see why this number doesn't matter? When you plug in a number to that, you're going to get all constants. What happens when you take a derivative of constants? Zero. So really, only that matters. So you're going to get a derivative x to the fifth over five minus one fifth. What's the derivative of x to the fifth over five minus one fifth, ladies and gentlemen? Which proves it? Well, at least for this example. I basically kind of proved it here with this statement here. It's, it's done. There's some more serious proof to it if you really want, but that's basic enough for us. Now, that you could do directly. Some of them you can't. So when you get to this, this integral like this, I don't want you to spend too much time on it, because there's no way you can do this integral in this particular class. 
Well, let's say you had something from 1 to x sine of t over t, dt. You can't do that integral directly. You can't do it the same way I did it. All right, it's not. You can't just hammer at it. Not in your integration table. You can't do it. However, because you have a derivative of an integral from one to x, from a any a to x, you can use the same property right here. So, how much is this going to be equal to? Sine of x. Sine x over x is right. That's exactly correct. Now, one thing. It does have to be defined for the entire, just like, remember how we found out last time, it's got to be defined. You can't, it's got to be continuous. It's got to be very nice. Uh, you can't have the undefined points. It has to be balanced somewhere. Are we okay here? 1 to x. Remember, this is the small number, so it can't go backwards. Are we okay? What's the one number that's not okay? Zero. We miss a zero, so we're okay. If this had gone from, like, negative 1 to x, we'd probably have a problem, because we couldn't evaluate that integral. Yeah, that's it. So when you get to some of your homework, some of it's going to be kind of easy. Uh, if it looks like this, a derivative of an integral, and you're going from a to x, and it's defined for that whole region, I mean, it just starts higher than any problems that you have, that's all you got to do. Plug in your x's and you're, you're done. A derivative will undo an integral. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. Part one. Part one. What did I say? Two. Part one. That's it. I'm cool understood that. Good for you. That's fantastic. I wish all integrals were like that. I know, right? <laughs> well, the thing is, we don't always take derivatives of integrals right next to each other. It's not, it doesn't happen very often. But it's a, it's a statement that says it is true. It's proving that they are inverses. Now, we're going to move on. This is typically a different section in most other books, but the, this book ties it all together with this. We're going to continue doing definite integrals, only we're going to do some more... I guess tricky ones, they're not super tricky, but they're going to incorporate something you've already learned in this class, which I guess is kind of nice, but we haven't dealt with it yet. We're going to talk, start talking about how to do definite integrals that might involve a substitution. You ready to learn how to do that? It's not hard. You've already learned substitution, right? Yes. So if you've already learned substitution, I just have to tell you what to do with the bounds, the bounds of integration. After that, it, it, everything falls into place. So same idea. Let's look at how we deal with bounds. That will be our, the rest of our lesson. <laughs> okay, so, oh, what are we on? We're still on uh, four, four. Four point four five. Four point five. This is still a, a <coughs> extension of that. So, we'll talk about definite integrals. But this time we might have some substitution. It's still in your best interest on your homework to check if you can do the integral without substitution. If it's just a simple distribution or a simple, a simple changing of some exponents from square roots into one half, so I think we had one of those last time, right? Mm -hmm. And you combine them, that's probably easier than substitution because substitution might even work in that case. But if you have to use a substitution, at least you know how to do it already. Uh, there's, there's basically two methods. I'll show you method one first, and I'll show you method two. Method one says this. It says you're not going to change your bounds.